So, our partners, uh, I'd like to welcome you all and thank you all for joining us on another auspicious evening with another fantastic guest. Um, before we start, my name is Paul Charney. I'm chairman of the Zionist Federation. Um, we will be taking questions after our special guest speaker, Ken Mazik. Um, he will be speaking and then you, you should be, feel free to ask your questions. Um, the questions you can post either on the chat um, and there's a chat um, button at the top. Uh, we'll try and get to as many as oh. questions or you can message us uh, or on Facebook. A um, little bit of housekeeping, if everyone can ensure that their computer is muted so that we can get best reception, bearing in mind the technology. So please mute, mute your screens. Uh, and on that note, we'll get to questions thereafter. Um, I'd like to begin. So tonight we have Ken Mazik. For those of you who don't know who Ken is, Ken is renowned uh, around the world as a fantastic, phenomenally active speaker on behalf of Israel. Um, a little bit about Ken, um, which I know I'm sure he wouldn't want me to go on. I can go on for quite a while, so I'll try and cut a little bit shorter. Um, Ken is, as an Israeli speaker and writer, inspired thousands with a phenomenal story, backstory of his life. He is the son of Mizrahi Jewish refugees from Iraq and North Africa. Um, and he's an important voice today, and especially in this discussion, sharing his family story of the 850,000 Jewish refugees geez, from Middle East and North Africa. Um, as a young Israeli, Ken served in the IDF for almost five years as an openly gay Israeli IDF commander. He worked as a, uh, during his service, he was a lieutenant in the Kogat unit, um, which is the cooperation between the Palestinian Authority, the UN, and many non-governmental organizations in, in, in dealing with, with those territories, specifically operated in the West Bank. Um, Chen has been um, awarded with many articles in many different publications including the LA Times, NBC News, Haaretz, The Forward, Jewish Chronicle, International Business Times, and many more. He shared his story with thousands and thousands across the USA, Canada, the UK, and other places over the last eight years. In September 2016, Ken started working as a freelance consultant to help pro-Israel groups like the Zionist Federation with um, getting the message out there and with all the social justice causes that he works hard for. Um, he volunteers as head of the Transgender and Health Department at the National Israeli LGBTQ Task Force, also known as the Near Cuts Cutters Center in Tel Aviv. Ken is very active on social media and has a proven track record of creating dialogue where there is none and changing hearts and minds where it almost seemed impossible. So I'm going to stop there because people didn't long to hear me speak about Chen. They Chen, they want to hear you speak. Welcome, thank you, and the platform is yours. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for uh, for having me. Thank you to the Zionist Federation and uh, WZO, I believe, for uh, hosting this uh, this event. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you and and having such an audience um, tuning in to uh, to listen to this conversation during Pride, um, talking about. Um, LGBTQ rights in Israel and, uh, and Israel as a whole. And I think pride is more than just uh, um, about LGBTQ issues. So uh, thank you all for joining. Um, and uh, uh, I've just to point out, I volunteered at the New York Cut Center. I don't, I no longer work there, um, but um, and I'll talk about that later on as well. Um, and we're, um, you know, I'm joining you from Tel Aviv. And during this, this time last year, I was, uh, uh, I was probably marching uh, the Pride Parade uh, that is canceled this year, unfortunately. Um, so it's uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to uh, to speak to you all um, uh, and to share um, the message of Pride because um, it's such an important one. Um, and I think, as I said, when when we're talking about Pride, we're talking about being authentic to um, to who you are and being and accepting who you are. Uh, and um, um, and for me, it was a process to uh, to come out. Um, 
uh, as a gay person, but it also was a process to come out in really accepting my identity. And um, uh, it started with my with my family. It took me years until I really, you know, until I was a teenager when I was really, uh, um, you know, I was made aware of where my family came from, but I never took real pride in it um, until I was a teenager when I started speaking with my grandmother and um, hearing stories about their lives in the Middle East and in North Africa. And my grandparents from my father's side uh, uh, were are Tunisian Jews. They came to Israel uh, in the early 50s from Tunisia, from Jerba, um, Jerba and Sfax to cities in Tunisia. Um, and when I grew up, I didn't know that um, you know, that it was hard for them in those countries um, until I started asking questions. And then uh, I found out more and more details like um, that my family faced uh, um, hardship in Tunisia um, during World War II, uh, where in the Nazis, the Vichy regime was controlling North Africa. My grand grandfather and grandmother from my father's side had to work in a forced labor camp and um, uh, really were uh, uh, victimized by the Nazis and um, were supposed to be sent to uh, uh, to death camp in Europe, and then the war was over and they were liberated. But growing up, I didn't even know about this part of my history, um, only when I really started uh, um, being, a, being made aware of it um, by, by asking questions. And um, from my mother's side, from my, my Iraqi family, they came also uh, in, in 1951. And the stories about Iraq that I grew up with were always about how amazing Iraq was for them and how, you know, they had a great time there, but the more I asked questions, I understood that there's some sort of romanticization, romanticization of the past. Um, and I found out that uh, they really went through a lot of hardships, uh, like the Farhud, like during those two days of uh, um, violent attacks against the Jewish community of Iraq, uh, where my grandmother um, witnessed real horrors uh, uh, in Iraq. Um, and in 1951, they're packing everything they have and they're coming to Israel. I'm, uh, I'm always starting with a story because no matter what topic I'm speaking about in regards to Israel and the Middle East, um, I'm always sharing the story of my family because uh, I believe it's, first of all, it's very important for people to hear about it uh, and to learn about it. But it's, um, for me, it's, it's almost as if it was forgotten from the pages of history and, and from much of the conversation about Israel and the Middle East. Um, the fact that uh, 51, 55% of Israeli Jews today are uh, descended of Jews from the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, when people talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and, and we're seeing it a lot today in America, they're talking about it uh, in terms of race. And uh, race does not play any ish, any any part in this uh, uh, in this conflict. Um, my family were, you know, they came from they they were in Iraq for centuries. Um, the Jewish community is scattered throughout the world. Of course, some of us uh, went to um, to Iraq, to Yemen, to um, uh, to Europe, to Spain, to um, uh, all over the world and then we came and then we returned to to our homeland um and i'm you know i'm very privileged that i was born here and not in those countries today when i'm looking at the countries that my family came from and how intolerant they are to uh lgbtq folks and um when i grew up uh in israel i always uh you know i was waiting to join the army it's something that uh every israeli it's it's a mandatory service so men serve for three years um women serve for two Two years ago today, they're talking about uh, decreasing the amount of um, months that a man serve uh, and then uh, raising the uh, the months that uh, um, female soldiers uh, serve. Um, and um, when I grew up, when I, you know, growing up in Israel, most of my friends were talking about joining combat units. They wanted to, um, to fight for the country because when you grow up uh, with a lot of violence around you, you really want to do something to make a difference. You want to um, to participate in this, uh, in, in the important work of protecting your family. Um, a lot of people don't know that, but uh, and, I mean, people that live abroad, um, maybe non-Jewish people that live abroad, they don't understand that when we're talking about the Israeli Defense Forces, uh, we're talking about an army of soldiers that are driving two hours from their house for, you know, to fight wars or to defend their, their homeland. Uh, we're not sending soldiers uh, thousands of miles uh, away from their homes to fight for uh, gas or oil or democracy or values. That's not the wars that we're fighting. The wars that we're fighting are wars to defend our borders. And um, that's why when, uh, um, when, when we grow up, we, we want to do something that can really bring security to our families because our family's life are always um, 
you know on the line when we when we're talking about uh, um, about our military service. Um, but while most of my friends wanted to join uh, army units that were um, doing proper security, I decided to join um, a very unique unit uh, in the Israeli army. It's called the Kogat unit, the coordinator of government activities in the territories. Um, it's the humanitarian unit of the Israeli army. Um, and uh, it's a unit that works throughout uh, the West Bank, Judea and Samaria and in the Gaza Strip on the border. And our work is basically to work with Israeli, with Palestinian civilians and coordinate between them to the uh, Israeli authorities, to the IDF, to the, uh, um, to the non-governmental organizations that are uh, working in the West Bank and Judea and Samaria and Gaza. Uh, so I was stationed first in Hebron, uh, well, sorry, first in Ramallah, then in Hebron, uh, then in Jerusalem periphery. Um, and uh, my job was to be um, the liaison to the UN and the international organizations. And uh, back then I was still in the closet. And um, I remember that I always thought it's going to be very challenging to come out. And I had some thoughts that I might just have to stay in the closet forever, which was a very sad thing um, for a person to think about. Um, but uh, I had a commander in the army and he was really like a role model for me. And um, um, I remember I was very heavy back then when I was a teenager, I was uh, twice my size now. And um, and this commander always told me, you know, Khan, one day you're gonna go uh, to officer training school and you're going to become an officer. Uh, and I said that I don't think it's gonna happen because I was very heavy. Um, but he said, no, no, you're gonna do it. And I believed him, uh, I hoped it will happen. And uh, I remember that the, the time that I really started thinking about coming out, um, was when um, I went to meet a good friend of mine, uh, a combat soldier, Israeli, tough guy. Um, my friend, his name was uh, Alon, and Alon told me, um, he said, listen, Khan, I've been thinking about it for a long time, um, and I wanted to, you to know that I think I'm gay. And I said, what? There's no way, you know, you're the straightest guy I ever know. He was really a uh, tough guy. And he said, no, no, I think I am. And I said, wow, that's... Maybe it's just a phase, uh, said some bad things that I shouldn't have said. And, um, and, Alan, um, and Alan says, no, I mean, I just want you to accept me. And, uh, and I said, of course I accept you. And I went back home and then I started thinking, you know, how did he do it? How did he came out? I mean, he's um, such a, in my mind, he was such, such a, um, what I called back then straight guy that uh, um, it was surprising. And the following day I went back to the army and I saw my commander. Um, and he said, what's wrong? And I said, well, you know, my best friend just came out of the closet and it's very hard for me. Um, and he said, why, why is that hard? And I said, well, you know, just because he's a combat soldier and I, uh, I don't know how he's going to deal with it and how his family will accept him and how his friends in the army will, will accept him. And my commander said, um, Ken, I think there's something else. And I'm saying, uh, what, what else? And he says, well, you know, it's looks it's pretty clear that you're also gay. Uh, so not helping me out of the closet, pulling me out of the closet. And for the first time in my life, I'm saying to my army commander um, that, uh, yeah, I think I am gay. And um, it was a long moment of silence. And then he said, uh, okay, but there's a bigger issue here. I'm saying, what? I just came out of the closet for the first time. Can I just get a moment to, um, to breathe? Uh, and he says, yeah, take your time. Um, do you need a hug? And I said, I don't need a hug. Leave me alone. Um, and he says, uh, um, there is the, the bigger issue is that you have a crush on your best friend, um, <laughs> which he was right because I did have a crush on him. Uh, <laughs> and he said, okay, I'm going to give you a day off. I want you to go back home. I want you to confess your love to you alone. And I want him to, and I want you to come back tomorrow uh, and tell me you have a boyfriend. Um, so I'm driving back home from back then I served in Ramallah um, and it's, uh, you know, I'm getting home, I'm um, getting cute and getting ready to meet my, uh, my best friend and to come out of the closet to him and hopefully ask me to be my boyfriend. Um, and I'm going to his house and I'm waiting outside and he comes outside and he says, um, let's go. And I'm saying, before we go, I wanted to tell you something. And he says, what? And I said, well, what you did was very brave. And I wanted you to know that, um, I think I'm gay too. And he said, what? No way. You're the straightest guy I've ever met. You can't be gay. <laughs> Thinking the same thing about me. And I said, no, no, I think I am gay. And he said, um, 
oh, that's so cool. And then he shows me pictures of other guys that he's going to go on dates with. And I'm getting very visibly upset. Um, and he says, what's wrong? And I said, well, you know, I think I, I wanted us to, to go on a date together. And he looks at me and he says, well, I can't date you because now that you're gay, you need to understand there's leaks. And you can date people that are fat like you. He actually said the word fat. Um, and I'm dating people that look like me, that are fit. Um, really breaking my heart in this moment. And I, uh, I remember I had tears in my, in my eyes and I went to the car, got back into my car, drove home, couldn't listen to what he said, um, put on Adele, crying my heart out. Um, and the following day, I went back to the army and my commander, I remember seeing, seeing me, was like nodding his head and saying, what's wrong? Come to my office. Uh, and I said, well, you know, you just ruined my life because I came out of the closet. I won't be able to be an officer now because everyone knows I'm gay. And I, you know, I lost the love of my life. And it's all because you told me to come out of the closet. And he said, listen, Hen, you're going to be the best officer the IDF ever had. Uh, and I'm going to promise you that. And the most important thing is that this guy is not the love of your life because the love of your life, the love of your life will not treat you this way. Um, and now that I have... The, Today, when I have my the love of my life, I know that it's uh, that it's true that someone disrespects you this way. They're not worthy of uh, your love. Um, and after that day, uh, my commander and I started working out together. And what started at what what was you know five minutes running uh, turned into a whole hour. And I uh, actually passed the the test to the officer training school. Became an officer. I finished first in my battalion in officer training school. Um, and I was appointed to be uh, the liaison officer to international organizations in the UN in Hebron. And uh, to be, um, you know, that, that story was in 2008 um, when other countries had policies of don't ask, don't tell. I mean, until this day, uh, other countries are, when their armies are dealing with challenges of uh, accepting uh, LGBTQ soldiers, specifically trans soldiers. And that's something that Israel was, you know, uh, years ahead of them um, in, in, in combining um, LGBTQ soldiers uh, and, and allowing them to serve as uh, um, to serve openly. Um, now, being an openly gay commander or LGBTQ soldier in the army does not mean that you, um, you know, that, that I went to every base with a pride flag and told, you know, everyone that I'm, uh, that I'm the gay officer. Uh, it just meant that I had the backing of my commanders, that um, if a soldier misbehaved if, because of my, uh, because I'm gay or if a soldier said something that wasn't uh, proper, um, if other soldiers had difficulties and challenges for being an LGBTQ person, and I had a few soldiers coming out of the closet to me, um, uh, I, I could support them and I had the backing of my commanders. Um, one time a soldier made a homophobic remark uh, towards me and, um, and my commander sent them to uh, a prison, uh, march, uh, like, army prison uh, for two weeks for a homophobic remark, which, which was really uh, amazing for me to see. But, you know, the most important thing was the message that it sent to other soldiers. Um, and that's something that I'm very proud of, you know, to see that it happens throughout the IDF and everywhere in the IDF. It um, uh, doesn't mean that we're perfect. And, you know, there's soldiers that there's bad apples in every army and in every society. Um, but the, you know, the society is measured by how it's dealing with its uh, with those bad apples, and um, and I'm very proud of the IDF and the and the fact that I was uh, I felt really protected so much so that I came out to my own commander rather than coming out to my family. I came out to my family late, later on in later stage, and that's still a challenge for uh, Mizrahi family to uh, to deal with because of the societies they came from. Uh, but it's um, but they're they're getting there, and. Um, you know, and I, I ended up serving for uh, for five years, um, and after military service, I uh, I started um, traveling around the world and and sharing my story and the story of my family and the story that I just shared with you. Um, and often I ran into um, ridiculous accusations uh, against Israel um, about how we are. I don't know if you heard this term, uh, pinkwashing. Um, pinkwashing is a term that uh, was used to call out. Um, uh, commercial uh, companies that were uh, putting pink ribbon on their products to say that they are donating the profits um, that they are making from the products to fighting breast cancer. Um, because when, And when they didn't really donate much, um, the term uh, emerged that calling it pink washing. 
Um, and now it's been appropriated by, ver by anti-Israel people all over the world uh, that are saying that Israel is pinkwashing, which means sending people like myself or uh, other LGBTQ folks around the world and pushing us to whitewash um, the atrocities, the alleged atrocities, atrocities that are happening here. Um, and that's, um, you know, it's just another way of really erasing all of the achievements that um, that Israel has done in uh, with, with not only with LGBTQ uh, issues, but in general with social justice. Um, everything positive about Israel is now being um, immediately being erased as propaganda. Um, uh, and this term of pinkwashing is just uh, so offensive. Uh, and you're seeing today in um, by you know by several LGBTQ groups um, that this term is being adopted. And just last year there was a, um, a lesbian march in uh, in DC where they um, told the participants not to bring uh, Jewish uh, not to bring uh, LGBTQ flags with Jewish star on them, or at least to not put the Jewish star in the middle. Um, in uh, Chicago, they forced out. Um, um, a lesbian couple that had a, one of them uh, had a Star of David uh, flag um, with her. Uh, and that's something that we're seeing increasing that um, in the LGBTQ communities, um, um, LGBTQ Israelis and, and Jewish LGBTQ activists are being really shut down, silenced and forced out. And it's uh, really disheartening because from a community that established itself on uh, being inclusive, on, on fighting um, uh, horrific uh, violence and, and um, uh, intolerance um, because of our identity uh, to do the same thing to other community just because they're Jewish or just because they're Israelis um, is really heartbreaking. Uh, heartbreak, heartbreaking for me, um, and I, I think you know Israel is not perfect, and it's important to remember that that Israel is 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 a country and Jews are people. Although a lot of people don't think that we are real people, uh, we are real people, and and uh, we we make mistakes as I as I said before and. Um, but there, there's a lot to celebrate. I mean, there's uh, from 19, 1963 was the first time that uh, um, same-sex relationship in Israel was uh, decriminalized. Um, and then later on in the 80s that uh, it was actually protected um, by, by law. Um, and uh, th this progress is keeping on happening. And just a couple of years ago, I remember that I went down to Tel Aviv to just a few blocks from my house where uh, hundreds of thousands of Israelis came together to protest um, uh, same-sex surrogacy laws um, that uh, discriminate against, uh, well, well, surrogacy laws in Israel that are discriminating against same-sex couples. Um, and that's something that we're fighting to change. And I know that, uh, that today it's, uh, it's part of the agenda in the government, um, in a government in the Knesset where there's the, ha the, you know, the record number of uh, openly uh, LGBTQ people, uh, MKs. Um, and uh, for the first time ever, we had a gay minister, um, Minister Ami Ohana, uh, which it doesn't matter what you think or where you stand on his uh, uh, ideology and, and politics, which, you know, everyone in Israel disagree with anyone else about politics. Like you can't find two people that agree on anything political um, in Israel. But, you know, the fact that there is a representation for uh, the LGBTQ community and specifically with the minister uh, is a huge achievement and something that we should celebrate, that we must celebrate. Um, and and you know that's that's some that's part of this uh, uh, part of the problem that we have when when we speak about um, uh, those uh, those com communities that are weaponizing their queer identity uh, against um, uh, LGBTQ Israelis and there is a big struggle that that is you know uh, is I believe one of the biggest challenges that we have as a community that we still can get married in Israel. And I think it's uh, even more important before surrogacy laws and before anything else that uh, we can, you know, if while we are protected and while we we have all those rights and, and the police protects us. And when I volunteered in the near cut center, I remember how we, you know, every time I sent a, a request or, or a report about um, LGBTQ phobia uh, incidents in Israel, immediately it was taken care of. And, and um, uh, if someone was, uh, um, you know, companies really afraid of being tainted as anti-LGBTQ. Um, but this, 
this issue of not being able to get married that is a, i believe is a basic human human rights and it shouldn't be discriminated and it's not we're not discriminated because we're lgbtq we're, we're there's just a problem with the marriage institution in israel that um um it's being run by religious groups so uh the rabbinical council is the one that will approve jewish wedding um the islamic walk will allow muslim weddings and the uh and the christian church i guess in jerusalem would uh, would approve uh, Christian weddings. Um, so just a Jew is able to marry a Jew or a Muslim to a Muslim and a, and, and a Christian to a Christian. And also part of it is the part of the of, of the same sex marriage. So uh, civil partnership is something that we uh, we have to work on. And I know it's something that Israelis um, are trying to change. The Tel Aviv municipality just uh, last week announced that they're going to recognize same sex marriage. So uh, um, it's small and doesn't mean a lot. I mean, they, they will they will accept same-sex couples that are registering um, um, as same-sex couples in the municipality and will give them the benefits that they can give them as a municipality. But, um, you know, the recognition itself is still something that we're fighting for. Although there's, if, if a couple is married abroad, that's important to say, um, if, uh, if, a, if a wedding was performed abroad and the couple returned to Israel, same-sex couple, uh, they are able to register as a um, um, uh, in civil partnership in Israel and receive the same tax uh, benefit, tax benefits and, and um, any other elements of uh, married couple. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's basically, you know, that's that's part of what we have to do. We have to work on changing that uh, and, and improve the situation uh, for LGBTQ folks. But um, but with all with all the criticism, we have to remember that uh, Israel is still a Middle Eastern country and it's a country that uh, surrounded by other countries where LGBTQ folks are are being oppressed on daily on daily basis, um, that gay people are being hanged just you know a few hours drive from here, um, that in Gaza the situation for LGBTQ people is uh, is still terrible. And um, I don't mean to say that as in you know look at how bad they are and and how good we are. It's not that. I mean we have a lot of issues that we need to fight for. Um, but when we constantly hear in this uh, focus on LGBTQ rights in Israel. Uh, while ignoring what's going on throughout the Middle East, uh, in, in every country in the Middle East, and how gay rights are still um, not, I mean, LGBTQ people are still not protected. Um, that's something that we must uh, all speak up about, and we all must fight. And that's that's what Pride is about. Pride, is a, Pride was a riot. It was uh, fighting against um, a violence, against intolerance, um, and changing people's mind. And that's something that um, I think you know we all have the, the obligation to do to to speak up for those invisible people that uh, the world has uh, completely ignored. Um, I uh, Paul, should we take some questions or because um, I I can keep on talking, but I I would like love to hear if the because I'm seeing just questions popping up. So absolutely, kind of fascinating, and honestly, you could keep going. We could keep listening. Um, the, the story the story writes itself. Um, but I think, yeah, let's go to some questions and I think you can elaborate on your story through yeah. the question. Yeah. Um, so let, let, let me let me go through, bearing in mind, everybody, thank you all for your questions. Fantastic that you're engaging. We will try to get as many questions as possible. We've got some of the chat, we've got some of the Facebook, we've got a whole lot. So let's see if we can, we can get through as many as we can. Um, so... Ken, one of the first questions we had is, do you know in which year it became legal to be gay in the IDF? Um, and also, um, is, it, is the IDF party the, possibly the first army in the world to openly permit gays into service with no form of sanction? Um, so I'm, I'm not sure about if it was the first. It was definitely part of the first. Uh, one of the first armies to uh, to allow it. Um, but the great thing about the Israeli army, about the IDF, is that um, we're saying there's a saying is in in Israel that everyone knows that "Tzava um, uh, bonet Tzava," which means that the the people, the Israeli people, are building the army, and the army builds the people. So everyone that are going through the the army are, you know, we are creating what the Israeli army is, and then the Israeli army actually creates the Israeli society that comes after. Um, and uh, that's that's that goes to to the point about um, uh, say you know protecting and decriminalizing same sex relationship. Uh, everything that is happening in the public in Israel uh, affects the army. So when the government passed this uh, this law to protect same sex uh, relationship, it automatically was adopted by the Israeli army. And it's um, Israeli army today is 
you know, I, I know that they are so uh, tolerant for my, I have uh, transgender friends that are serving in the army that are able to do it. And the army is so well adjusted and, and taking care of them and their needs, uh, actually sponsoring um, uh, um, uh, tra- um gender disp- uh, treatment for gender dysphoria and, and, and helping uh, transgender um, um, people go through the operation and, and funding that, which was, which this is, you know, definitely the only army in the war that is doing that, um, uh, that supports, I mean, even in, in America, there was a question about if the army should uh, allow trans people to, to serve uh, openly. So um, the, the IDF is definitely leading in this field. And it's, um, uh, again, it's really part of uh, what's going on in the Israeli society. And, and, because it's a mandatory service, um, they're try- the IDF is trying to, from you know, from top down, to make sure that um, uh, soldiers have all the conditions they need to um, to serve the army in the best way they can, to serve the country in the best way they can. Um, because it's a mandatory service, because we don't have many people here, and we have to, uh, you know, uh, every soldier uh, matters, and uh, and you really feel that, you know, it's. With all of its uh, flaws, the, the army still is able to to provide a, a supporting um, uh, environment for um, for soldiers, and that's uh, for you know for young people, and that's uh, I think it's very important. Okay, that, that's that, that's I mean the, the army is a big topic, to be fair, and I'm sure it also depends on which units you're in. Which areas of the army? I suppose it depends in which, whether in the air force, the navy, or or Sadir in the in the green in the green the the ground forces. So, um, but I'm sure you could elaborate on all that. I've, I've had a couple of questions, a few questions. I'm going to try and join them together on on, on gay Palestinians. Um, and first of all, one a couple of the questions are um, if you could just elaborate what it's like to be a gay person or LGBTQ plus person in a Palestinian society? And secondly, um, uh, is there any way Israel supports these Palestinians, possibly by refuge? If you can elaborate on that, please. Yeah, definitely. Um, so if, if we'll start with the Palestinian society and the intolerance that uh, still exists um, um, in, the, uh, in the Palestinian society, uh, I think it was uh, there was a Pew research in 2000 and 2013, I believe, um, that um, found that uh, I think something like 93% of uh, Palestinians that were asked um, answered that uh, being gay is uh, uh, immoral and uh, a sin against God. Um, and you know, when you get when you get 30%, 40%, 50, even 80%, that's a lot. But when 93% um, said had this answer, and uh, I think eight, uh, I think like five percent were just uh, refused to answer. Um, there was only there was only one percent that um, um, that said that it's uh, uh, that it's okay and that it's moral. Um, it tells you a lot about a society. And um, actually, got a quote from uh, 2019 Palestinian Security Forces spokesperson Colonel. Um, Luai Isrikat, he described activism for LGBTQ rights as a uh, blow to and violation of ideas, ideals and values of Palestinian society. Uh, he, resp- he responded to uh, the Palestinian Authority decision to ban Palestinian gay and transgender rights group uh, from holding event in the West Bank and threatening to arrest uh, the participants. Um, all of this is not meant to, and it's very important that people understand that it, it's not meant to um, to taint Palestinian people in a certain way. It's just telling you that uh, the the leadership and the officials um, uh, from the government down to uh, to the police, to the head of the police or the spokesperson of the police, are telling you tell tells you know re- on record quotes get, gives a quote that's saying that gays and and, and the LGBTQ uh, rights is not something that. Uh, um, aligns with the Palestinian uh, ideals and values, which is just uh, uh, disgusting. And I think that, um, you know, if you go uh, to the West Bank and, and if you and, and I spend a lot of time there, um, it's, uh, um, you know, the, the treatment of LGBTQ people is, uh, um, uh, is, is done in very in much, you know, in mockery and attacks. And uh, there's um, every, few, every few weeks a case of violence against, sorry, <clears throat> A case of violence against uh, LGBTQ um, Palestinians, and uh, they certainly get uh, refuge in Israel. Um, I I was involved in few cases like this that 
you know, we can't really um, go to BBC and tell them that uh, that we're doing it because we have to protect the identity of those Palestinian LGBTQ people. But um, when when we find cases that we can help, we are helping, and we're helping with, um, you know, everything from giving them new identity and and uh, helping them move to Tel Aviv. Um, and uh, oftentimes, I think in every case that I was involved in, um, you know, the the, the new name and the new identity is a, a Jewish Israeli identity and they completely leave behind all of the um, everything they they went through and it's um, it's it, it's really sad and disheartening to uh, to see it but it's uh, but I'm also you know happy that Israel can offer them the, the, this refuge um, and I was involved in several cases like this um, I, I read online that people say that uh, Israel is using um, LGBTQ folks, uh, Palestinian ones for intelligence. And that's something that is completely um, false from my experience working with the Shin Bet in the West Bank and, and, and Judea and Samaria and uh, being involved with them. It's nothing that I've never ever heard of. Um, there were cases that, you know, LGBTQ Palestinians would come to, to our office because my unit is, has Offices in every major Palestinian city where Palestinians come to the uh, to the to our reception hall and they can speak to soldiers and uh, if they have cases that they need help with, we're uh, we're trying to help. Um, and many times we had Palestinian LGBTQ people coming to us and asking for help, and it's a process, so we can't really you know we're trying to help as much as we can and and at least like two times I had uh, two or three times that I had uh, Palestinians that came to us, told us that they have an issue, and then they disappear the following day. Um, it's not uh, its not a random thing. It happens very often, and it's um, uh, and it's sad, and I wish we could do more. And, you know, I'm, I'm hearing all those, uh, there's there's a few big Palestinian LGBTQ groups that are trying to promote LGBTQ rights in, Pal in the Palestinian territories, um, and they're all uh, working from within Israel because they know that um, uh, they won't be able to to do anything um, uh, in the West Bank, Judea, and Samaria, and Gaza, um, and part of uh, it's you know what's really sad is to see that they are um, when they speak about those those oppressions, they accuse Israel and they're blaming Israel for uh, for the problems that they have instead of really showing appreciation that you know on the one side of the fence they get safe space to do what they what they need to do, and on the other side they are being attacked. Um, and instead of supporting, and instead of being open and really honest about the situation, uh, there I read a lot of their statement. It's very deceiving. I guess it comes a lot from uh, um, you know the need of being loyal, and and if you're already uh, considered, and, and I know it from my own you know from my own experience with um, my community that um, uh, um, you know sometimes you feel like you're you, you have such a burden of shame that you're trying to show that you are at least loyal in in many other ways. Um, and I guess this is where it's coming from. But, you know, the situation uh, there is not really pleasant and there's uh, much, much more work to, to be done, but it can only be done once we acknowledge the situation. And unfortunately, I don't think anyone uh, is really serious about acknowledging the situation. And the only victims are Palestinian LGBTQ people. Fascinating. Um, Chen, could you, could you tell us a little bit about when you travel overseas? Um, you, you've mentioned a little bit about people throwing either hypocrisy claims at you or duplicitous claims or paradoxical, I don't know, all the different claims, all the different potential um, labels that they throw at you because they, I don't think it's possible people can't get it around their heads that we're so, Israel is so advanced and here's the proof, but hold on, I have a preconception about Israel and it doesn't fit. Tell me what's your experience on the campuses and what's your experience around around the world when you do these talks and any strange experiences that you've come across? Uh, wow, uh, yeah, so, well, I mean, um, the, mo the best example would be London, um, that uh, you probably remember that um, 300 students um, broke my talk and tried to uh, stop me from speaking at University College London, um, just to make sure, sure that a person that is of Iraqi and Tunisian background uh, and is openly gay uh, will not be able to speak and share his story. Uh, in the same year, they had, you know, generals from the IDF speaking at UCL. They had um, people that were combat soldiers coming and speaking. They, they were okay with all of them speaking, but the only person that, you know, they went out of their way, got 300 people, jumped through windows, like broke the door, tried to break down the door, uh, really were violent to other students. 
um, was was me. And I think that I don't think it's about anything I say. You know, I can. Uh, I mean, of course, if I'll be very anti-Israel, they would they would love me, and I'll probably get uh, you know more speaking gigs and uh, and get money thrown at me as I see some of my uh, not colleagues but people on the other side that are uh, falling to this anti-Israel uh, propaganda. Um, but, you know, I'm, I can't do it. I have to be true to who I am. And I think that they really are annoyed by my existence and, and that, that, that I represent um, again majority of Jews in Israel that are Mizrahim uh, and that are people that never left the Middle East. Um, all Jews started from here, of course, from Judea, but just the fact that majority of the population is population of Middle Eastern people completely, um, you know, shatters the, the anti-Israel narrative. Um, and uh, I actually just, there was an article claiming that I, me personally, is, um, I'm Mizrahi washing. Mizrahi washing is a new term um, that basically is saying that, um, that I, the fact that I speak about Mizrahi um, people uh, meant, is meant to divert their attention from the horrible treatment of Palestinians that allegedly Israel is, uh, is responsible for. Um, you know, I, I'm, <laughs> I wish I could just, uh, um, I, I wish it, I don't know. I mean, I, I think I got to a point that I'm so, uh, I'm not blasé, but I'm just like cynical about all of it because it's becoming so ridiculous. Um, but then I remind myself that while it looks, it, it, it is ridiculous for me, for, for you, Paul, for people that are watching us, um, for for other people, it's not ridiculous. And when my, uh, my non-Jewish boyfriend from London is sending me posts about pinkwashing and he says, you know, I see a lot of my friends engaging with it and believing what it says there, that if you are, and, and I mean, it's, it's so insane that people are telling, you know, LGBTQ people believe that in order to support LGBTQ rights, you have to oppose and, and boycott the only country that has LGBTQ rights um, because of its oppression of uh, other LGBTQ people. But I mean, you completely ignore everywhere else in the Middle East and everywhere else in North Africa and everywhere else in China. And I mean, is the fact that there's police brutality in America against black people um, means that we should not go out and, and protest for pride, that we should not celebrate LGBTQ rights in America. It's just, it's not a lot of people saying it, that it's not a double standard, it's a single standard um, to Israel, really, you know, um, trying to erase any positive, anything that is good about Israel. And that's, um, and so that's, you know, to answer your question, I'm, at some point I'm, I'm like, I'm not even surprised about, um, about any accusation, but you know what, I do have one story. Um, I was speaking at university in uh, California and um, there were a group of uh, like 10 people that came to protest and they shouted and shouted. I started my talk. Uh, when I started my talk, they, they stopped and they sat down. And there was one, um, uh, most of them were, were young students. One of them was a, a, an older woman. And um, at the end of my talk, she raised her hand. She said, well, you know, all this pink washing and accused me and stuff. And she said, just so you know, I'm a professor here in this university and I have a question for you. And I wanted to know how many, um, how many Palestinians were raped by Israeli soldiers uh, in the last five years? And I said, well, that's a great question. I know the answer because um, the number is close to zero. There were, in terms of sexual harassment reports, there wasn't even one report from Palestinian um, uh, about Israeli soldiers uh, sexually harassing them. And she says, yeah, I know that. And I said, okay, so what's the question? And she said, um, I have a research here that proves that the Israeli army and Israelis are so racist that you are disgusted by the Palestinians. And it's clearly showing that because you're racist, you're not raping them. So you need to be ashamed of yourself. Um, I, <laughs> I just stood there and I was just, <laughs> I was shocked by, uh, by hearing that. And I actually found a research online that um, was, was conducted in the Hebrew University, no less, um, that found that the reason that there's no sexual harassment, I'm sorry, I'm laughing about it, but it's really sad, it's really sad, it's, you know, that's, that's what that's we're doing. That's the worst I've heard, it's the worst line I've heard, and I've heard a lot. That is, I mean, how, do you, how do you respond to that? Without going, I mean, it's crazy. I just, I, I asked her after a while, I said, so what is the number of rapes that a country should have in order to not be racist? What would be a good number in your insane mind? But you know, they'll go that far. And that's a professor in a university uh, that is teaching other students and probably teaching them this research that she found that proves that the IDF is racist um, because they're not raping women. 
Yet there are instances of marriages between Israelis and Palestinians, or Israelis and Israeli Arabs and Israelis. Yeah. That's, that, that's kosher, honestly. Um, unless we could go on fair about that. Can I, I, I want to come back. There's a few more questions about um, the lifestyle and the, the rights that you have. And you mentioned a lot about Tel Aviv. And mm -hmm. it's very openly accepted in Tel Aviv, probably more than anywhere else in the country. What, then the question is, what is it like in the rest of the country? Is there a separation between Tel Aviv and the rest? And secondly, also, how long do you think it will take Israel to catch up for uh, the LGBTQ um, um, community to catch up to heterosexual, full heterosexual rights that they have? Um, okay, so I... I I, I think a change is coming. I'm hopeful. Um, I would give it like, I don't know, five to 10 years. Um, um, we'll, we'll have to see. It's all depend, depending on the government and, and uh, what the results of the elections will be and if it will be a priority for them. Um, but um, Israelis just in many ways are just learning to live with what we have, you know, if it's the land that we have or if it's uh, the area and the enemies or whatever it is, we're, we're learning how to deal with it. And I think in like this, uh, the, the fact that many uh, same-sex couples are traveling abroad and coming back um, is, uh, it's okay. I mean, they're learning how to live with it, but I don't, I don't know if it really helps promoting this issue. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm hopeful that, uh, that it, this will change um, soon. Um, you know, I can't really estimate. And your first question, I'm sorry, I missed it. Just regarding the ge geography, LGBT geography. Tel Aviv seems to be open. What's it like Hi. in the Right. So, uh, I mean, it's Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv is really not an example of the rest of Israel in, um, uh, in terms of how inclusive it is and how welcoming it is. Um, my boyfriend that comes with me from London, uh, he lives in uh, Tottenham area uh, and he says how, you know, he feels safe there. But then when he comes here, uh, he says that he feels even more safe than he does back home um, to, you know, to hold hands together or to be in public together. That's... Um, uh, it's really safe and it's and and you feel it in the streets um but yeah there's a lot of work to be done uh in other areas in israel um in jerusalem that just a few years ago uh, um a teenage girl was uh, uh uh israeli girl was uh killed in the pride parade um by a radical fanatic um uh um person that went and and uh, israeli that israeli and jewish person actually that uh, stabbed her um uh, but that's something that you know was condemned everywhere in Israel, and it's uh, um, and the the Jerusalem Open House received a, a big funding, uh, and and they really uh, are doing an amazing work there uh, to support LGBTQ folks in Jerusalem. Um, and this year, just last year, there was about 20 pride parades all over, or 30, I think, even even more than 30 pride parades uh, in in other cities. It wasn't as big as the Tel Aviv one, um, but the fact that other cities in Israel are uh, holding some sort of an event for LGBTQ rights um, is making a, a, a big difference. And uh, um, while while it's not the same, while, while not all of Israel is like Tel Aviv, uh, when you watch the Israeli TV, when you're seeing the Israeli Knesset, um, uh, you see, LGBTQ people are very visible in the news, in the um, in the in, in, you know in in TV shows, in in everywhere. They're they're very visible, and I think that the more visibility you have uh, in the public general public, when you go out of the LGBTQ uh, group that you're part of, um, you're making, uh, this is this is part of making a big difference and, and making a change for, for other LGBTQ people. So, um, so yeah, so Tel Aviv is like, I think it's very unique and very special from any other city in the world. Um, but, um, but it's also, uh, you know, I'm carefully saying it's it's safe and and there is and we're heading towards uh, progress in in other places. I don't know, you know, there, there is stories of violence against uh, LGBTQ people in in other country in other cities in Israel, um, but but it's not. But but it is safe, you know. Okay. That makes Thanks. sense. Um, I'm going to move subject a little bit topic. A, a good question from Mike. Um, what do you think, what are your thoughts of our new ambassador, Israeli ambassador to the UK, Tsipi Khotoveli? What do I think about her? Yes, and what do you think of the position of her specifically chosen as ambassador to the UK? Uh, wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think that, I don't know, I mean, given past uh, statements that I've heard from her, um, 
specifically regarding diaspora Jews and um, um, yeah, specifically about diaspora Jews. I think that it's, uh, I, I'm not sure if it's the right uh, position for someone like that. Um, that's just my personal opinion. Uh, I'm not representing the Israeli government in any way or shape. Although if you read online, there's some people suggest that I am basically the, the head of Mossad. Um, but you know, <laughs> right. But so, so just, that's just my personal opinion. I don't, I, I think there are other better um, candidates that could have taken this uh, important job. I mean, Mark Regev, I think is just uh, phenomenal, um, for example. So, yeah. Um, okay. F fantastic. Um, <clears throat> so we, I'm just going to go on to the, there's so many questions. Uh, a lot of it you've covered already. Um, Somebody were talking about people asking about the, um, the the partnerships between it within the other within Israel, so uh, same sex partnerships within the Arab community, Arab Israeli uh, Arab Israeli community, and the Christian uh, community. Are you aware of how they dealing with it? Is it are they able to express themselves? I mean, I I I know that they that I mean in. If you go to uh, to gay bars in Tel Aviv, you'll see uh, Arab gays and Muslim and Christian gays, um, Arab Israelis. I mean, um, so you see them. Um, I mean, they exist and, and they're able to do it in inside Israel. Um, they're able to live their 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 authentic life in inside Israel. Um, so uh, so yeah. So it's 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 really it's it's open. I, I actually you know that more. Something that is more interesting is to see Mizrahi LGBTQ people in Tel Aviv and how they come from the periphery into Tel Aviv and adopting a whole, you know, really able to live their authentic life while um, um, living behind um, where they're in their cities. Um, ma many times the family would reject them and they, and they have to start all, you know, start on you. Um, and that's, um, that's, you know that's sad, but I'm hoping that in a generation or two things will will change. I mean, I already see how things are changing, um, but I think it, Tel Aviv is probably the only place where there was a, a Mizrahi gay party um, for uh, that. You know, you have uh, Mizrahi Jewish singers. Um, uh, it's called Arisa, and it's um, it's like it, it used to be a big party line after with the Corona and everything. It kind of um, slow down, but it used to be a big party line with Mizrahi Hebrew Hebrew music um, with Eastern um, um, you know Hebrew he, Eastern music with the Hebrew um, um, uh, singers, um, and that was a, a big you know big draw in Israel. So uh, it was very. It's, I think that's that's a microcosmos um, of this uh, of of Israel. Um, coming back to the advocacy. Um, it's very difficult to deal with one of the questions dealing with all the how do you deal with all this, the, the many many issues uh, we, we have the same the same um, we have the same um, struggle um, when a commentator or media broadcaster or a when you're in debating the question is so is riddled with so many different inaccuracies that you don't know where to begin to start unraveling the lies and the the misinformation so it's very difficult to deal with everything. But one of the specific issues which we found to be quite effective, and we'd like to hear your opinion on it, certainly as a Mizrahi Jew, uh, about dealing with, um, certainly with it, it's connected together with the right to the term and the Nakba of the Jewish people. We were talking about Draw Yamini, who wrote a book on this. Um, have you found that to be accepted, dealing with the, 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 the disposition of, of Jews from Arab lands in all that time and how they have no rights of return in the same sense as the Palestinians. And is this, um, is this taught in the schools? Do, do, do Israeli schools teach that as part of the curriculum? Uh, well, we need a whole, uh, you know, separate Zoom call to, yeah. <laughs> uh, to go over all of this, but it's, I think it's certainly the most important um, part of, uh, of advocacy in this time uh, of Israel that is missing. I mean, a lot of things that are important, of course, but I think this is such a part that has been um, um, intentionally erased um, from, uh, um, from the debate. Uh, in Israel, they're changing it. I mean, today you have more uh, Mizrahi um, uh, poets and, and uh, Mizrahi history being taught. I remember that I grew up, I didn't even, I wasn't taught in high school or any, you know, not even in elementary school about um, about our history. The only history we learned about was, you know, the 
of what happened. Uh, and there is no, like one doesn't come on, on top of the other, they can't of the other. Like it's, um, we need to learn about the Holocaust and the Holocaust was the biggest human tragedy, not only for Jews, for in mankind. Um, but I think that in Israel, we were, we shied away from speaking about um, uh, the Jews from the Middle East and North Africa because of the importance that we gave, the, the justified importance that we gave to, to the horrific um, uh, genocide that we, we went through. Um, but I think, you know, we have to be able to speak about both traumas. Um, and I, I think that, you know, the, there's an intention, there, there's an intention behind this, uh, all those attacks that I'm seeing lately about the Mizrahi washing and uh, how, you know, Jews um, um, are actually, Ar Mizrahi Jews are Arab Jews that were, you know, we were, we were in the Middle East long before the Arab conquer, uh, conquest of, uh, of the Middle East. We, were, we are the indigenous community of, of this area. Um, and I'm, I'm seeing people saying that, you know, Israeli food is stolen from uh, Arab countries. It's not stolen. It's food that we had and we brought with us to this to this country. And I think it really shatters this narrative that Israel is this white country that is fighting uh, brown people. When you tell them, you know, look at the food, look at the music. Uh, and, and I see that some anti-Zionist, like young Jewish anti-Zionist um, that I speak with are you know, I, I think where they're coming from is because they can't really relate to Israel because they expect Israel to be, you know, Bagel and Lox and Barbara Streisand and uh, Yiddish. And they come here and they hear Arabic and they're hearing Mizrahi music and they're seeing Hummus and Shawarma. And it's a lot of things that they really, they didn't associate with what being Jewish is. And I think the more we expand it and the more we explain to young Jews all over the world that um, there's more than one way of being Jewish and we're all Jews, it doesn't matter. I mean, we, we all must fight anti-Semitism together because uh, you know, anti-Semites hate us because we're Jews, not because we're Mizrahi or Ashkenazi, it doesn't matter. Um, but if we expand this conversation and we include those communities and we teach young people that um, being Jewish is diverse and the Jewish world is so beautiful and so diverse, uh, it will change our community, it will make our kids stronger, but it will also send a very strong message uh, when people would, you know, in, just like you said, instead of instead of having to deal with all those false allegations about Israel every time, you know, in someone interviews you, um, just if this would be known, if we'll talk more about that, we will make a big difference. And I'm uh, I'm actually doing it these days when I'm I'm, I'm working on my first book. It's called um, Mizrahi, uh, a Jew of Color. Uh, it's going to come out in next year, and um, it's basically outlining this history that is missing and uh, really trying to bridge this gap um, that I, I really think is the is the key to fighting a lot of the hatred we're seeing. Not all of it, anti-Semitism is still going to be there, but uh, at least a lot of the misconception and can change hearts and minds, I believe. Wow, fantastic. It is such a big topic, the Mizrahi topic, uh, within Israel itself. And I think you're right. First needs to be dealt with within the society. Um, Israel now is even more diverse with Soviet Jews, with Ethiopian Jews, um, and certainly the Arab Israeli uh, population and the Haredi populations. <laughs> we really are a right. one big Poland um, in a big country. Um, let me ask you one one final question, Khan. I mean, it's been phenomenal, and we can literally listen to you all night, and uh, we don't want to keep you from other Zoom. But <laughs> let me ask. Let me let us ask you one question. What what can we do as a community to help out? How can we uh, firstly, relating and listening to what you have to say and when we come to Israel. Um, but is there anything we can do, the, the way we, either the way we communicate, either the way that we relate uh, in Israel itself or the way we understand um, to, to, to help the rest of the country understand as well that you're fighting your plight? Um, what, what would your advice be to the rest of us? Um, well, first of all, I mean, clearly supporting the Zionist Federation and continuing programs like this, because this really makes a, no, really, I mean, it's, uh, uh, I said I'm invited to some Zooms in, in America, but this is uh, the only one, well, I might have another one, but this is the first time that, you know, a UK organization is interested in this story and this uh, about LGBT, you know, first about LGBTQ rights in Israel, but also about Mizrahi. And it's, you know, your, I think your your work is tremendously important. So supporting the Zionist Federation is very important. Um, and uh, uh, I think that, you know, doing this, doing those uh, interviews, being engaging, sharing those ideas online, each one of the people that are listening to us probably has about a hundred or even, even if less, uh, Facebook friends, um, and they can all be, you know, ambassadors of education. And by sharing one story about Mizrahim or about LGBTQ rights, something positive and teaching others, 
uh, we can make a difference. That's how anti-Israel propaganda works because they're they're miseducating people. We can really educate with the truth and, and the facts because the truth is on our side. You know, we don't have to work that hard. Like if if anyone, if everyone would just know the real facts, um, uh, we can make a massive difference. And when you come into Israel, instead of only going to Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, which is great, and I think it's important to, to come to those cities, try and go a bit outside of Tel Aviv to the periphery of Israel. Um, if you come to, if you, and even if you stay in Tel Aviv, uh, try and go to the um, LGBTQ center or uh, uh, Ethiopian center. There's an, a new Ethiopian center that was open in, uh, uh, in, Tel Aviv, in Florentine, it's called Beta. Um, and I can send you information about that later. But learn about different communities in Israel uh, and, and go outside the, you know, I mean, go to the Western Wall, go to the beach in Tel Aviv, enjoy Israel, because I don't want you not to enjoy it, because that's why we love it. But expand your horizons. And that's, I think, that will serve everyone very well. Uh, it will serve you, but then it will, you know, it will also serve uh, um, um, the cause uh, because you will have experiences that will go with you and then you can share them with others. Fantastic, we will do that. We will try to and we'll keep, we will keep in contact with you and we will do this again. And hopefully once we've passed this, uh, this COVID crisis, we'll have you in person as well again and you can come and speak. It would be fantastic. Um, yeah. Ben, you're, you're a wonderful example of a modern Israeli Zionist. I mean, I can keep adding labels, so I'm gonna stop at some point. One of these Mizrahi Zionist LGBTQ <laughs> citizen and um, and certainly advocate and, and 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 a wonderful a wonderful ambassador for a modern Israel um, and and the, the rest are catching up and it's going to take time and and I think I love the fact that you know it's going to take time and I love the fact that you have uh, so much um, uh, tolerance for that. Um, that you know Israel so well, you know the people, and it's, it really is just a matter of time, is, is what we're saying. Um, and and, and that, that tolerance itself is an example to A, the rest of us, and to all of us to say, okay, you know what, you're in this position, you have the tolerance, certainly we, sh we should learn from that. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for explaining it to us. Thank you for keeping us enlightened. Please keep in contact. Uh, if there's anything you need from us, let us know. I want thank to thank all of our audience for engaging with us, for keeping connected, for staying in touch. Please all go onto social media and follow Chen um, so you can see and you can keep updated and, and you can follow on with this. This is just an opening discussion. This should now continue. This should now follow on. Um, Chen has just opened the door. You need to make the rest of the effort and the rest of the work. That's what we need to take from this. So thank you all, all for joining us. Keep in contact, stay safe, and hope to see you soon. I've been Paul Charney. We've been the ZF and the WZO, and you've been fantastic. Thank you, and good night.